طيب جود ايفنينج اند اي ثينك لايك وي اجريد لاست ويك تو كاري اون ذا ان سي كيو سيشن اند هير وي ار سو اجين وذ ذا سيشن اوف ان سي كيوز بيكوز يو لايك ات لاست تايم سو اتس مور انتراكتيف اند مور انفورماتيف اند اي ديفينتلي اجري وذ يو وي ستوب هير سو وي ار غونا موف اون تو ذا نيكست اون Just a moment. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so... The first and secure for tonight is which one of the following is most likely to be found in patients with long standing restrictive pericarditis? Geometrical distortion of the chambers, a rise in systolic pressure on inspiration, protein losing entropy, loud S4 causing precordial knock, abdominal shifting dullness. So what do you think is the right answer? Long standing constrictive pericarditis. Uh, do we have geometrical distortion of the chamber in, in constrictive pericarditis? No. Uh, no, categorically is not true. Sometime you can have geometrical distortion of the chamber and when you look at the heart you will find that the waist the heart is kind of wasted the base of the heart is constricted and the chamber are elongated so sometime there is geometrical distortion of the chamber but not always a rise in systolic pressure on inspiration do we have this one the reverse is true the reverse yes. is true okay protein losing entropy have you ever heard with about this in association with constricted pericarditis yeah it can happen yes it can happen okay yes. let's focus on the question the most likely to be found the most likely to be found in long standing constricted pericarditis so we are left i think with uh, two right you are left with two loud s4 causing precordial knock abdominal shifting dullness uh, so uh, anybody who is not speaking out please just switch off the mic so loud s4 causing precordial knock or abdominal shifting dullness uh, i will go with a shifting dullness because uh, which is a long side right yeah, yeah. Uh, loud s4 causing pericardial knock okay. so, uh, i will go with the c and also e, a, a, a lot of noises behind you yes there is a lot of noise yeah okay so uh going with c hamad are you going with c Protein, protein Maawiya, Maawiya going with C. Yeah, uh, e, e. So, I'm going with C. Uh, e. Okay, great. So ascites. Ascites is the most likely to be found in patients with long-standing restricted pericarditis. And I think this is the right answer. But why D is the wrong answer? Why D is the wrong answer? Because pericardial knock, it came with the S3. Exactly, because precordial knot is not S4, it's S3, S3, the very initial gush of blood from the left atrium to the, uh, from the right atrium to the right ventricle creates the S3, and the atrial contraction creates, creates the S4, okay? 
Okay? So, in constriction, we here allow it S3, not S4. Okay? So, the right answer here is abdominal shifting dullness. Okay? Protein losing in tropocy may take place with long standing constrictive pericarditis, but is not the most likely uh, finding in long standing constriction. Okay. Which of the following is not a deterministic effect of radiation? Of course, we are a cardiologist and we are exposed to radiation probably in two major places, the cath lab and the cardiac CT lab, okay? Uh, so which one are nuclear as well? I forget about the spectrum petria. So in three main uh, areas. So which of the following is not a deterministic effect of radiation? Nausea and vomiting, a plastic anemia, cataract, skin burn, and cancer. And of course, if you have nausea to answer vomiting. this one, nausea yes. and vomiting. And vomiting. Yeah. Nausea and vomiting. Uh, the, the problem with such kind of question is it's make or break. Yeah, it's very hard to guess about so you must know something about deterministic effect of radiation and you know exactly what this means and what is the other types of radiation effect. So we have two types actually, deterministic and stochastic effect. So they are two. For all radiation on Earth, you have deterministic and stochastic effect. Anybody knows about this deterministic effect? And the name implies something so, you know, meaningful, deterministic, deterministic, meaning inevitable. Hatmi, hatmi inno yahsal, iza hasalat hajatad, wahiya dose. If the dose exceed this threshold, this effect is gonna happen inevitably. Okay, so that is deterministic effect. A stochastic effect, on the other hand, is a slow cumulative effect of radiation over so long time of exposure. And it has no threshold. It's about the cumulative effect and how it's gonna affect, affect the body. So deterministic effect is nausea and vomiting, a plastic anemia, a cataract and a skin burn. Cancer is a stochastic effect. Okay, so this brings us to this one. Two types of radiation injury, deterministic and stochastic. Deterministic is dose dependent, like skin erythema, disquamation, bone marrow suppression, cataract, sterility, and fibrosis. A stochastic effect, the, the sole example of which is cancer. Okay, so cancer. So deterministic depends on the dose. I have seen one case of a patient who developed deterministic effect. And that is kind of shameful, Taban, <laughs> because the patient was on table for quite a long time with a very tough intervention. And at the end, we find that he had erythema and disquamation in the back. Okay, so that was because we have exceeded uh, the threshold of safety as to the skin effect, okay? Sometimes if you exceed certain threshold, you might even have bone marrow suppression, okay? Cataract, sterility, fibrosis, and so on and so forth, okay? While the stochastic effect is cumulative effect over a long time, okay? So the sole example is cancer. Did you get this one? Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now, what is true about the atherometer's plaque. Heavy calcification increases the risk of rupture. The thicker the fibrous cap, the more vulnerable is the plaque. The larger the plaque, the more likely to rupture. Proteinases aid to stabilize the plaque. Normal coronary angiogram excludes any degree of atherosclerosis. So which one is true? Here. Three. Three is true. Three. Three is true. Yeah. Okay. Any other opinions? 
Mm -hmm. uh, with, as last time, we discussed uh, every question individually. So uh, answer one, heavily calcification increase the risk of the rupture. It, it give more, more stabilization of the leg, which less risk of rupture. Good. Huh? Okay. The thicker the fiber is curved, the more variable to is blood, plague. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's wrong because it's thick, not a thin. Okay, good. And uh, routine is this? Yes. It, it, it uh, seems to like be the skeleton of the black. It's more... Uh, exactly. uh, because it's more erosion and digestion of the matrix, so more vulnerability. These yes. are enzymatic destruction of the matrix. Yes, of stabilization, okay. yes. Good. What else? Uh, normal coronary angiography, Five. it doesn't exclude any degree of atherosclerosis. Uh -huh. It's not an exclusion. Yeah. Can you explain further? Uh, because there is, uh, it's a 2D, uh, it's not uh, inaccurate uh, to know the degree of atherosclerosis. <laughs> in two dimension, yes. I mean. The coronary uh -huh. angle will see the coronary okay. in two dimensions. So we cannot estimate exactly uh, the degree of atherosclerosis of the vessels. So I think, uh, Dr. Maha, you have explained them all so correctly. The only addition I want to add mm -hmm. is for number five. Uh, yes, you said that sometimes the lesion is eccentric. So if you go for certain orientation in coronary angio, you might miss it. And that's why you have to scan the artery in different orientation to circumvent the problem of 2D while dealing with a 3D structure. So eccentric lesion can be missed if you uh, restricted your orientation profile. This is one thing. The other thing is that, remember the natural course of a seroma, it's deposited in the wall first. And initially the vessel will go remodeling and this remodeling is called positive remodeling. So initially there is dilatation instead of narrowing. There is dilatation. Therefore, the atheroma is going to grow in the wall for quite some time before it leads to luminal narrowing. Narrowing, yes. Okay, yes. So the luminal narrowing is a very last phase of atheroma growth. So there are so many stages, the initial stage of which might be even extrinsic remodeling, meaning dilatation of the artery becoming more ecstatic, actually. Uh, the only thing that Coronary angio misses it because coronary angio is a luminogram. It sees the lumen. So the only way I can see the wall and I can judge if I have a seroma of any degree is to do cardiac CT. Because in cardiac CT, you see the wall and lumen. That's why cardiac CT has a negative predictive value of any seroma approaching 100%. It's 98-99%. So if, if, if CT tells that there is no atheroma, the confidence or, or the, 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 I mean, the negative predictive value is so high. So it's kind of excludes it, okay? Because CT sees the wall, but coronary angio does not see the wall, it sees the lumen. And it can miss what is going on in the wall. And we said that the initial phases of atheroma development is wall infiltration without encroaching upon the lumen. So coronary angio will miss it because of luminogram, cardiac CT will pick it because it sees the wall. You get this point? So the right answer here is that the larger the plaque, the more likely to rupture. So the size of the plaque, so if now let's tell what are the factors of vulnerability. One is the thinner the fibrous cap, the more of fatty core, the less of calcium, the more of size. You get that? The lesser yes. of fibrous cap, the more of fatty core, the more, the less of calcium, the bigger the size. Okay? okay. Good? Okay. Great. Now, a heated debate arose between a cardiologist and 
ER physician over the possible etiology of elevated troponin in a patient who came in with severe UTI accompanied by pyrexia tachycardia. The cardiologist claimed it was non-cardiac troponin. ER physician insisted the heart must have a serious problem. Which side in the argument will you take? Cardiologist, ER, none or both, or not at all. Uh, the, 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 I think this is not an uncommon scenario. You'll probably have this kind of conflict over troponin with ER physician and internist and non-cardiac staff, okay? Because we are speaking different language. So what do you think here is right? Who is right here? If the, the both. Both are right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, it should be a post of a right should be excluding criteria for a clarification more. But it could be a cardiac or non-cardiac. It can be cardiac and it can be non-cardiac. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other opinions? Uh... Uh, here, Dr. Hatim Zaydani mentioned which type of troponin. Uh, troponin uh, T. Think... Troponin T. Uh, okay. So I, I think we need to take the patient as a whole now. Because infection okay. can cause a rise in troponin. Okay. Uh, infection is a sort of stress and uh, cardiac troponin and other side of troponin can be excreted in stress from all the body. Even the heart. Okay. okay. So now yani, the cardiologist has claimed that categorically and absolutely this troponin is non cardiac, meaning it comes from a non cardiac source. Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. You disagree. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, troponin T is specific for uh, the heart. Uh, exactly. It must come from the heart. It must come from the heart. Yes, it is cardio specific. So to say that it's non cardiac, this is a mistake. You don't have to say non cardiac. It is cardiac. Yes. Now, the physician, the ER physician said the heart must have a serious problem to leak this level of troponin. Again, he is wrong. Because it is from the, from the heart, like in not necessarily due to a serious cardiac problem. So both are wrong. The troponin T and I, not C of course, then C is not cardiac specific. It is T and I. T and I are cardiac specific. Whenever you, have, you find elevated troponin T or I, and, and by the way, I is more specific than T as well. Uh, even. I, is... I, I is difficult to test for, but it's more specific. Now, yeah, yeah. The, both of these two troponin comes from the heart. Now we shouldn't say it's non-cardiac. We better say ischemic or non-ischemic injury. It comes from the heart due to ischemic injury in acute coronary syndrome, and it comes from the heart due to another injurious mechanism, which is not ischemic. Like infection itself causes a low grade of myocarditis, and that leads to troponin elevation. A stroke and intracranial major impulse can lead to a low level of myocarditis, and that leads to leak of troponin. Renal failure itself leads to a slow and low level of myocarditis leading to leak of troponin. So it's always the heart. It's always the heart. It's just ischemic or non-ischemic. Okay? You get the point here? So we shouldn't say it's non-cardiac. We better say and accurately say it's non-ischemic injury. It is secondary cardiac injury. It's secondary cardiac injury, secondary to the infection. Therefore, you don't have to direct the management to the heart, direct the management to the root cause, 
which is the infection. Now this makes sense. Okay, good. You get the point here? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, mm. we can found that the patient has uh, elevated troponin T. Yeah. So what is the kind of heart injury? Yes, uh, this is a good question. Actually, I have been working for the last seven years, or accurately probably six years, uh, in cardiorenal medicine. I have established a dedicated clinic of cardiorenal. And I have seen so many patients with elevated troponin. All of these patients are manifesting a low-grade myocarditis or pericarditis or myopericarditis. So if you have an elevated level of troponin in acute renal failure or chronic renal failure, the heart is affected somehow. But you cannot do anything. It's not ischemic, so you are not going to intervene in any way. You are just going to control the, the renal failure and do whatever it takes there, and the troponin will improve. Okay? But it is an injury. Subtle subtle form of myocarditis and pericarditis and myopericarditis. Okay? okay, okay. Sometimes it can lead to an overt uremic cardiomyopathy and cardiorenal syndrome type 1 and 2, you know? Yes, it can. It can. But when we see or when I see elevated troponin with heart failure, I get worried because that means I have a myocarditis or pericarditis, or pericarditis on board. Though they are of low grade and probably long standing and stuff like that, but it's also prognostic. Yani patients with elevated troponin with chronic renal failure on dialysis are not like patients on chronic, re, chronic renal failure or in this stage renal disease on dialysis and normal troponin. They are never the same. Okay? So don't shrug off don't shrug off elevated troponin in all scenarios. You might have nothing to offer this patient, but remember, it's always from the heart and it's always a manifestation of some sort of injury to the heart muscle or precardiac. Okay, so this is a, uh, as you see here, um, this is vegetation with severe destruction and abscess formation in the aortomitral junction, what we mm. call, uh, they call it sometimes intervalvular fibrosa. Okay, so um, abscess vegetation. Okay, I have seen a couple of patients when there is a fistulation as well. So when you have an abscess in the root, it might burst into the left atrium, forming a fistula. Okay, so it becomes our two atrial fistula, our two atrial fistula, okay? I want you so much to remember one thing because this is crucially important. Any patient with aortic valve vegetation, like this patient, this is aortic valve, okay? Any patient with aortic valve vegetation, you should follow this patient by inflammatory markers by clinical markers but there is one important method of follow-up which is tell me ECG for BR prolongation thank you so much BR mm. thank you so much ECG it's cheap yes. and easy and informative yes. if there is an abscess formation it can be picked up from the ECG even prior to TEE and we have patients when we did TEE it looks like normal and we missed it, but the ECG was showing a very prolonged uh, PR interval or some sort of blocks. A week later, the abscess was so full-blown and uh, necrotic and, you know. So ECG changes in terms of blocks, okay? Yes. This is so important in the diagnosis of abscess formation in the routine patient with aortic valve vegetation. 
So I think we should make it a habit, whether in the guidelines or not, to do at least daily ECG as part and parcel of the follow-up parameters for patients with aortic valve effective colitis. Okay. Now, which one of the following statements uh, best describe the troponin? They belong to the catalyst family, the zymatic family. They reside in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of their type can be used in the diagnosis and or prognosis of a circular syndrome. TNI is more specific than TNT, and the higher TNT in stroke is due to cerebral tissue increased cilies. So, I think this is easier after we discuss the troponin. ER I think and the D, D. This is D. D is the right. D, exactly. D. So why why A is wrong? Isn't it an enzyme? No, it is a protein. It's structural protein. protein. It is structural protein. Exactly. Yes. The, are they in are they not in the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Yeah, they are out. They are out. Exactly, they are in the. They are in the cytosol. Yes, uh, they belong to the in the contractile unit. Actin, myosin, and tropomyosin. Okay, yeah. they belong to this unit of actin, myosin, and tropomyosin. They are not in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of their type can be used in the diagnosis and prognosis of acute carcinoma. Which type do we have? And the have, most common is TNI. Uh, exactly. So there are three types, T, I, and C, right? T, yes. I, and C. We can use T, we can use uh, I, but not C, why? Because it's not color specific. So T, troponin C, Isotype is the same as in the muscle. Yes. So they are isomer. The skeletal muscle troponin C and the cardiac muscle troponin C are same, are the same. So you cannot use it because it lacks cardio specificity yet. But troponin T and I are not present in the skeletal muscle. They are different types. So you can use this one. Now, what about E? If you, I, if I need you to correct this wrong statement, it relates not to you to cerebral tissue in, uh, injury. It due to also the cardiac stress during. Thank the... you so much. Thank yes. you. Exactly. So now we get it. It doesn't come from the brain. It comes from the heart. But this is a secondary cardiac injury due to this massive stroke. Okay, good. Well done. So this is uh, the troponin. You see the sarcoplasmic reticulum and you see the actinomyosin and tropomyosin and you see the TI and C. Good. Now, this is a 41-year-old female with history of palpitation and shortness of breath and there went echo exam. And here is the echo. Uh, anything you are observing here, unfortunately, you can see the flow. But if you see the image on your left side of the epical four chamber without color, any glimpses? Mm. A, look at it, I'm zooming it in. I think there is an ASD in this patient. Uh, or, you see the mitral valve, you see the left atrium, there is something. Uh, uh, like a uh, membrane. Exactly, like a membrane. So what is this? Coat, coatrium. Triatrium. Yeah? Yes, you see this one here? Exactly. Exactly. This is core triatriatum. Okay. The question is still to come. Uh-huh. Sorry. Now, send for TEE, and here is the TEE. Now it's becoming so clear that this is core triatriatum traversing 
the LA cavity into two parts. Good. Now, cardiac CT again is done, and I don't know why. And here is the membrane, which is so clear. Core triatriatum. Now, the question is, which complication of AF ablation will give you a similar hemodynamic effect? So the question is kind of acrobatic a little bit. Uh, which complication of AF ablation will give you a similar hemodynamic effect? Pulmonary vein stenosis, atrioesophageal fistula, left phrenic nerve injury, LA perforation and preparatory effusion. So we need an AF ablation uh, complication. I will go with a pulmonary vein stenosis because uh, one of the. Uh, no, I cannot, I, I, I see, cannot see the pulmonary veins, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Rictora, I think you could go with Haya. No, I'm with Maawiya, as he said. Okay. There is a. Yes. Yes. How come pulmonary vein stenosis, which is a known complication of AF ablation? and the most feared complication actually, why does it give similar hemodynamic effect like core triatriatum? Uh, because of the flow, Dr. Hatim, the flow, uh, mm -hmm. the core triatriatum, the flow is, uh, will be uh, uh, yeah, impeded, same like Balmeris was very, very good, very good. So you know, this will, uh, this is going to broaden our idea about mitral stenosis. So when we say mitral stenosis, that does not necessarily mean the mitral valve is stenotic. We can have a similar effect of mitral stenosis if we have the obstruction anyway along the path of blood that comes from the pulmonary veins into the LV. So if you have pulmonary stenosis, yes. If you have core triatriatum, yes. If we have supra mitral ring, yes. And mm. if we have parachute mitral, yes. So look here, I'm gonna show you something. Yes. So if here, if you take this one, this is the left edge. The obstruction can be at the level of the mitral valve. It can be down here, and this is called parachute mitral. It can be just at the annulus by a congenital ring, and this is called supramitral ring. It can be called triatriatum, and it can be at the level of the pulmonary vein obstruction, like the atrogenic as a complication of mm -hmm. AF ablation. Okay, so these are, see how many levels? One, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five four. levels of obstruction. Five mm -hmm. levels of obstruction. Yeah, five. Pulmonary yeah. vein, the cortiatriatum, the supramitral ring, the mitral valve itself, and the subvalvular apparatus like parachute mitral. All of which give typically similar picture like mitral stenosis. Okay? So, so now uh, pulmonary vein stenosis, that's right. And here are the complications related to catheter ablation of uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, Osophageal injury, perforation or fistula is less than 0.5%, cardiac tamponade is 1 to 2%. Uh, pulmonary vein stenosis is less than 1%. Phrenic nerve palsy is 1 to 2 if it's persistent. Okay, so these are uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the repertoire of the complication relating to the AF ablation. So, a 65 year old lady has been complaining of shortness of breath class 3 for over a month. The GP has referred her to the cardiology service after cursory evaluation, assuming cardiac condition. In the clinic, the cardiologist 
picked up soft systolic murmur on the aortic area coupled with soft second heart sound and fourth heart sound. Echo show ejection fraction of 65% with moderate LVH and grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. There is degenerative aortic valve, the mean gradient across which was 30 after exhaustive interrogation. What is the most appropriate next step? So now we have a scenario of a asymptomatic patient who on clinical exam showed sign of severe aortic stenosis, soft second heart sound and, and things like that. And S4, and on echo, the ejection fraction is normal, but there is advanced grade of diastolic dysfunction. There is moderate LVH and a mean grade degenerative aortic valve, but the mean gradient is falling short of severe aortic stenosis. So after exhaustive interrogation, so they have done right, prostenia, suprastenia, they have tilted patient left and right, and so they mm. did their best. So what are we going to do now? Then the patient for AVR based on this data, which conform to severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, or invasive hemodynamic will most likely settle the discrepancy by disclosing higher gradient, or the CCT to quantify aortic valve calcium score, calculate the stroke volume index by transthoracic echo, do TE for better visibility of the aortic valve for anatomical area measure. Mm. Um, I'll go with the discrepancy between the symptoms in or in the cases. Calculate stroke volume index by transphoric echo. If it is less than uh, 34 mil per uh, meter square, so this is low flow uh, severe okay. rotation. Okay. 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 And how are we going to calculate the stroke volume index? Uh, I will zoom the LVOT. Uh, I will take the dimension of the LVOT, uh -huh. uh, multiply it yeah. by the uh, TVI of the LVOT. Uh -huh. Multiply it by? Uh, 11.785, multiply okay. by uh, E2 uh, square, multiply by the okay. TVI of the LVOT. That will be the stroke volume, right? That's the stroke yes. volume. Now the stroke yes. volume index is? I will index it by the surface area. Surface, the surface area, exactly. Yeah, surface area. So, exactly. So what is the stroke volume index that will indicate this aortic stenosis is You said if the flow is more yeah? than 34, uh, if the flow is more than 34, uh, mil per meter square. Yeah, let's so begin. I'm not 35. Let's say 35 is fine. Uh, Less yeah. than or equal than 35 ml per meter square. That indicates low flow. Low flow despite normal low ejection flow. fraction. That's why it's called paradoxical. Naqid or haja gariba. Because we have low flow despite normal ejection fraction. That's why it's called paradoxical AS, okay? So if I find a stroke volume index equals to or less than 35 ml per meter square, I might be dealing with paradoxical AS, which is severe and the patient is symptomatic. But all the options there are not categorically wrong. All the options might be right. But like the most one we usually do in case before of the patient, yeah, before the patient leaves uh, the, the echo lab, is to measure the stroke volume index because this is an important uh, glimpse towards paradoxical uh, AS. Okay. Now, if you have paradoxical AS, sometimes the surgeon are not so convinced and they are not uh, with us in the same wavelength and they, they insist that we need a solid proof of severity. In this case, you can do cardiac CT to see how much of calcium is scored in the valve, more than 1,500 for males and more than 1,200 for female. That indicates severity. 
Some people wish, wish to go for invasive hemodynamic, but invasive hemodynamic is unlikely to elicit higher grade because of pressure recovery phenomena. So usually if you see, if you compare the gradient obtained in CAT lab, the mean gradient obtained in CAT lab versus the mean gradient in the echo lab, usually the one in the echo lab is or are higher, okay? But sometimes you can take the patient just like that because you have you know, what looks morphologically severe aortic stenosis and symptomatic patient. But the very right answer is to quantify the stroke volume end. Okay, good. Now we have a 74 year old man seen for evaluation of exertional disease. His symptoms began approximately two months ago and occurred during moderate or severe level of exertion. His past medical history includes hypertension, DVT 20 years ago, following knee surgery. Current medication are hydrochlorothiazide 25 daily, metoprolol 25 twice daily. On physical exam, blood pressure is 132 over 74, heart rate of 84, lungs clear. JVP is normal, carotid upstroke is two plus tardus parvus. The apical impulse is localized and not enlarged. There is late peaking systolic murmur with diminished uh, aortic uh, stenosis, uh, with diminished aortic component. No systolic click is present. Uh, peripheral examination shows no edema. The remainder of clinical exam is normal. So, so far, we have clinical features of mm, not so conclusively severe, especially the late peaking, right? Mm? What about late peaking? What do you think about late peaking systolic murmur? Uh, it will go with uh, severe aortic stenosis. Exactly. Late peak. So late peaking versus early peaking. So if it peaks late means there is a force to eject the blood out. There is a high resistance for ejecting blood, so the pulse peaks late. So that indicates, no, indicates severity. What else indicates severity here? Uh, the uh, so, soft aortic component also. Exactly, because when you have severe aortic valve degeneration and stenosis, the leaflet will hardly go up so they will not generate much of sound when they close, okay? So the second half sound will be diminished. So we have clinical features of severe aortic stenosis. Let's go for echo. Echo, ejection fraction 68, wall thickness 13, LVOT diameter 2, LVOT TVI 30, aortic valve TVI is 90, Mean aortic gradient 30, aortic valve area 1.2, estimated pulmonary artery systolic pressure is 32. Now, which of the following is the next best step in the management of this patient? Again, we have the same problem like that patient, right? We have a mean gradient of 30. I want you to calculate for me the dimension less index. What is the dimension less index here? Uh, the LVOT uh, mm -hmm. DVI divided by LVOT uh, of the aorta. Mm -hmm. How much is that? Mm -hmm. 30 over 90, right? Uh, yes. Which right. so is point, point three, point three. Three. So, uh, no stroke volume. Okay. Right. What point is the stroke three. volume? Let's calculate the stroke volume. I, I am going to calculate uh, it. Point 0.785 uh, times. What's the diameter of the LVOT? 1.2 uh, times 1.2 times what is the TVI of the LVOT? Two. The LVOT, two, Dr. Hatim. The LVOT is Sorry? two. 
זה אל ואותי דיאמטר איס 2. דיאמטר איס 2. 2 times 2 times the TVI which is 30 times 0.75. That is 94. 94 is the stroke volume all of it. Not when we use one. The index. Yeah? Not the index. Index is 94 divided by the body surface area which is not provided here, is it? Is not yes. provided. Yes. So we are yes. lost here. Uh, there is a problem with voice. Okay. Voice is okay. Okay, good. So what are we going to do here? Aortic valve calcium score assessment. Invasive hemodynamic cast. No fit. Sorry. Uh, exercise stress test or the vitamin echo. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do here? My Hara. <laughs> Hara, yes, I know. <laughs> Our technology score is uh, calcium scoring A. Number one. Okay, number one. Uh -huh. But, yeah, you can go opinion? with uh, exercise. Exercise stress equal to vitamin. We have a normal LV function. Uh, like we can go with exercise stress echocardiography. Yeah. And then we will calculate the parameters again. Yes. With exercise. Calculate what? We exercise him. Why should we do that? Uh, uh, we will check for the main gradient and we will check for the pulmonary arterial pressure also. Uh, type. I tell you, um, why, you know, if, if you stress a patient, exactly, if, if you stress a patient with our stenosis, he might develop hypotension and, and all of these things, and that yes. indicates, yeah, I have an obstruction, like in, yeah, in that will not confirm severity. And when you are looking into the gradient, sorry? There is no discrepancy between the gradients and the area also. So there is no need for further stress intervention. Exactly. And the problem is if you put a patient on a treadmill, <laughs> if you put a patient on the treadmill, his heart rate is gonna go fast. And with tachycardia, you tend to have lower aortic gradient. Remember this, with tachycardia, yes. you tend to have lower aortic gradient and higher mitral gradient. This is important. With tachycardia, that's why we can exercise a patient of mitral stenosis to elicit high gradient, but we shouldn't do that with aortic stenosis because in fact, we are gonna have lower gradient. Because with tachycardia, the, the diastolic filling is abbreviated, so the flow will go low and the gradient will go low. Okay? So exercise for eliciting higher gradient in aortic stenosis is futile. It's futile. The vitamin echo is completely reserved for patients with low ejection fraction. So the vitamin echo is out. Exercise stress echo is out. No further diagnostic studies, I don't know, but the patient is symptomatic and we have to do something. So we are between one and two. Why with this, with this, with this age? By the way, you are not wrong, you are not wrong, yeah. Uh -huh. with, 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 this, with this age, I think uh, calcium is called to rule out the scoliotic. Uh, it's not bad, right? Mm. It's not bad. Okay. Ma ino inta arif al mushkila shnom. Al mushkila usually ma severe or 
لما يكون بارادوكسيكال and you have demonstrated low ejection fraction yes لكن انت عارف البيشنت دي الستروك فوليوم حقها 94 اوكي او البيشنت الميل ده لو الستروك فوليوم لو قسمته على 2 مثلا حسبنا انه البادي سيرفيس اريا از كو ويتش از بيج وان هيطلع 40 بلس ما عنده مشكله في ستروك فوليوم اوكي يبقى از نوت بارادوكسيكال so we are missing something here here is the time when you say you know what probably the echo is not gonna get it we have to see other modality completely other modality yeah. and invasive hemodynamic is the way to go in the invasive hemodynamic they are gonna measure the stroke volume again the maximum gradient and the mean gradient and all these data are analyzed together to see what's going on so this is an indication for invasive hemodynamics Okay, when you are stuck between a symptomatic patient and an echo which is showing you moderate aortic stenosis and which is not paradoxical. In this case, you just have to go invasive. And that's here, if we see these things, the symptoms, severity match and mismatch, because this is an area of, of, of much of uh, controversy. If I have a symptomatic patient with severe aortic stenosis, It is straightforward, surgery or TAVI. Symptomatic patient and severe aortic stenosis by echo, the best you can get. Asymptomatic patient and moderate aortic stenosis by echo, again, I'm okay. This is again straightforward. I'm going to follow this patient up and no intervention for the time being, right? Now, the problem comes when I have a mismatch, symptoms, Severity mismatch. Like if the patient is symptomatic, but the echo fails to demonstrate severe aortic stenosis. Or if the patient is asymptomatic and the echo demonstrates severe and very severe aortic stenosis. Here is the problem. Now let's look for the first one. Patient is symptomatic and no severe aortic stenosis. In this case, the very first thing you do is to exclude paradoxical AS. If it's not paradoxical AS, you go for cat-based hemodynamics. Now, if a patient is asymptomatic, asymptomatic, but the echo is showing severe and very severe aortic stenosis, what are you going to do? Please answer. It's a size. It's a size. Good. You agree with that? You agree with that? Uh, Dr. Doctor Hatem, symptomatic and not severe AS. Symptomatic, asymptomatic, but severe aortic stenosis, asymptomatic. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can. Uh... You can do the exercise test. Yeah. There's some other cardiologist might think, why should I? He's asymptomatic. We see severe aortic stenosis. I'm just going to follow him up. Is there any problem with that? Is there any problem with that? Uh, uh, the risk of mm -hmm. uh, sudden cardiac death. Yes. The risk of sudden cardiac death with asymptomatic aortic stenosis is not high. It's not like symptomatic or aortic stenosis will is LV dysfunction. And the risk of surgery, and the risk of surgery, I tell you something, the risk of surgery for aortic valve stenosis, which is severe and asymptomatic, is probably higher than leaving this patient alone. So why should I exercise this patient? You probably exercise. Uh, I think patient. the guidelines I mentioned, if the risk, if the risk is less than than one percent, exactly. Uh, yeah. The risk yeah, is low. Yeah. Yes. And it is very severe, and then you can carry on for surgery. Yes. And the other thing is that sometimes you you probably have seen these patients when you ask him if he is symptomatic, he says no. Now, that's not the end of the discussion. The discussion should be. 
what amount of exercise and exertion he is doing daily to conclude that he is asymptomatic. Because sometimes patients are smart and they play down their symptoms for fear of surgery and intervention. Okay? In this case, subjectively, the patient might underestimate and might mislead you. So the way out is to do objective assessment of his symptoms on the treadmill. So, but if you are sure that this patient is asymptomatic and he is walking briskly daily and he's confidently fine and subjectively and objectively fine, then I think that's it. You don't have to. Lakin is a patient is playing down his symptoms or he's not sure of his symptoms. I think you have to go objectively by assessing these symptoms on the treadmill. Lacking they magale doctor in the guidelines now they are lowering the threshold to operate on patients who are asymptomatic if the risk of surgery is low. It alfi khwana hi al fikra bta fi al guidelines bi kullaha is what it's a cross talk between the disease itself and the management risk. What is the risk of disease and what is the risk of the management of disease? If the risk of the management of the disease is equal to or higher then the disease itself, you don't have to manage it. But asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis can at a mortality haggatu less than 1%. A surgery in mortality haggata, 1%. You gamanata equal or higher. I would not touch this patient. Lakin al an it has a technology of surgery. A mortality from operation has come down lesser than one. Therefore, become a risk of surgery bigger, lower than the risk of the aortic stenosis, which is asymptomatic. Therefore, we are starting to operate on asymptomatic patients. Lakin is still not class one indication. Okay? Good. What is this? Uh, this metallic uh, valve. Yes. Uh, okay. Panas formation. Panas formation. So, Maawiya, uh, Maawiya, you said panas, right? Uh, yes. I came from Mosfihaya, but it seems panas formation is. Panas. So, can can mm. can you tell us about this panas? What is it? Uh, a layer overgrowth of the tissue around the valve. Okay. Uh, okay. And due to? What's the reason of panas formation? Aleva industrialization of the valve. يعني في بعض الناس بسلام tissue overgrowth. Exactly. Here to cause malformation of the valve. Proliferation. Yes, yes. It's a proliferation of the tissue. Okay, inflammatory source of tissue like granulation tissue. More or less, it's idiosyncratic. يعني ما في حاجة معينة تقدر تتنبأ بها. It's just like the keloid, you know, the scar. Some people forming big scars, some people are not. So probably it's more or less similar to this. Like you know, it's not an immune reaction. It's not an immune reaction. We know that. Okay. Now the panas is different. Both panas and thrombus can occlude the valve. Like in panas is more of gradual process. Huh? Gradual process. Mungkin yasal elevation in the gradient and stuff like that. Gabul ma yamal. Gabul ma aywa gabul ma yamal. Sudden stenosis. Like in a thrombus can lead to sudden stud valve. Okay? Wa bitkun acute shwaya. Like in al panas is a long standing process. Now, which one is more common in female? In female, al panas. Is common in males or females? I think in female, panas form. Yeah, it's more common in female. Say, but panas, is it more common in aortic valve or mitral valve? In the aortic valve. And aortic thrombus, is, yes. And, and the thrombus, is it more common in aortic valve or mitral valve? Mitral valve. Mitral, exactly. So the thrombus more common in mitral than aortic. Panas is more common in aortic than mitral. 
اوكي لاحظ هنا البانس it can grow annular and come in the middle so they call it annular growth a thrombus is orificial growth it is start in the middle عشان كده it can occlude the valve very acutely and suddenly لكن البانس it takes time لانه it start from the annulus and goes centrally okay عشان كده we see panaces without occluding the valve with just high gradient because it is it is restricted the effective orifice area without leading to occlusion of the uh, the disc لانه it's annular with thrombus is orificial now if i have a patient who comes in with a metallic valve and i did echo i demonstrated high gradient high gradient when i compare this high gradient to a gradient 3 6 months later uh, earlier it was more or less the same it was high and the patient was called patient prosthesis mismatch but the new event now is that i have a moderate intrinsic ar moderate intrinsic ar what do you think about bonus process why because it is uh, gradual so and it's slowly and it's not different from the previous one as I, if i understood it were correct yes Yes. So it is panas, huh? Like in, yes. uh, 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 gradient is the same. How can you explain the moderate intrinsic AR? How can you explain the moderate intrinsic AR? I I'm telling you a real story. We have a patient, I think middle age. The last echo was done three months earlier. And his mean gradient was six. And the one before was 55 and stuff like that. When he came in, his mean gradient is again 60. But the new thing is that now we are seeing a moderate intrinsic AR. We are seeing moderate intrinsic AR. From where prevent this moderate intrinsic... Huh? Prevent the valve to closure. Exactly. It is exactly. leaking. Mm. It is so alarming. It is so alarming when you see moderate intrinsic AR and metallic valve. It means that the valve is stuck in opening position. It's stuck in opening position. That's why there is intrinsic AR. So even if you don't demonstrate high gradient, the AR itself is an indication of a stuck valve. Now, the, now we have taken this patient too. To where you think? It's the operation room. <laughs> Not be before the operation. We need it to confirm. Fluoroscopy. 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 Yeah, yeah. We took him to fluoroscopy, and the fluoroscopy was so lousy, and it showed nothing. So, what's the problem there? Can fluoroscopy miss the stuck valve? Can fluoroscopy miss the yeah. no. valve? No. No, and yes. Yes. Say it. Hi, Adiktora, you said yes. Can you explain it how can fluoroscopy? It's also to a two dimensional image. Can be missed. Okay, great, great. But we usually we choose the the angle to see the opening of the valve. Usually in the floor, so we have to be accurate. Yes. Okay, good, good. يبقى معناته sometimes we can miss the orientation when yes. we can reveal the two discs so good and we see the stuck. يعني if you do it like abbreviated and shortened and you are in a hurry, you did not scan the valve panoramically. You might miss it. Like in the Haikun, technical problem. This is one thing. And there is another important thing that Floro can miss the stuck valve. And that is what? In tissue valve? Well, we talk about a tissue, a tissue valve. Yes. Mm, sorry. Tissue valve. Yes. Yeah. Especially with the panel formation. Uh -huh. The floor sees the leaflet movement, but 
uh, does not see any tissue inside the bulb. Yes, exactly. لكن دي برضو نحن ما بنفتش على إنه الفلور will will show us the thrombus. لكن we need to see if the the disc is stuck ولا mobile. Yes. Sometimes and I have done a patient. Okay, there was they have did fluoro and and they reported fluoro and I have seen fluoro by myself. It was quite normal. The range of opening and closure was normal. I did TE because the patient is symptomatic and the gradient is sky high. And I found a very large thrombus. Like in, guess what? The thrombus was so mobile. It goes in and out of, of the, the disc. It goes out and then in. So when I have done tracing by ECG, I find that like predictively, uh, the thrombus goes into the disc after the third, fourth beat. And it occluded the disc. Then it goes out of it and the disc is mobile again. Then back into it, and so it was intermittent obstruction, intermittent. That is why Floro can miss it if it's not long enough. That's why we tell our guys in the cat lab, please do long skinny, five beats at least, because you can miss this intermittent obstruction. Okay, so Floro can miss it if there is no adequate panoramic viewing of the valve, and if the obstruction is intermittent. That's why you have to be sure in floral lab that you have scanned the valve in all directions and you have done a long skinning to span at least five cardiac cycles. Okay? Good. Are you with me now? Yes. Yes. Of course. We have this 63-year-old man present with fatigue, exertional dyspnea, nausea, and dizziness, and orthostatic, orthostatic hypotension. After his initial evaluation, transthoracic is obtained with representative images shown. Subsequent to this, a cardiac MRI with gadolinium is obtained with images shown. Based on these imaging studies, which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Now I'm going to show you the echo and the MRI. This is the echo, and here is the MRI. So what's the diagnosis? Amyloidosis. Amyloidosis. Why? Yeah. Why you were so there confident? Is, uh, right, in uh, the, in the uh, MRI there is uh, ring enhance. Uh-huh. Uh, in the AQ, there is a uh, hypertrophy. Uh huh. Uh, the uh, um, concentric hypertrophy involving the posterior wall and the septum. Yeah. So and the echo is showing the echo. Yes, the echo is showing LVH with precardial fusion and low voltage in the ECG, as you see, and glistening texture. All of which are suggestive, but not diagnostic of amyloid. Lakin, you were confident that the answer is amyloid based on MRI, right? Yeah. MRI yeah. is showing a very unique pattern, which is this global subendocardial hyperenhance. Yes. It is almost pathognomonic of amyloid. Okay. So MRI is the diagnosis for amyloid. If, if I show you something here, which is so important, look at the pattern of delayed hyperenhancement in MRI. This is important. Delayed hyperenhancement pattern. There are different patterns and accordingly different diagnoses. Now ischemia tends to be like this one, subendocardial. This is ischemia, subendocardial. Why? Because we know that, you know the ischemic front? The ischemic front, it goes from endocardium to epicardium. So the most part affected by the ischemia is the endocardium, then the myocardium, then the epicardium, okay? That's why if I have ischemia, it will be subendocardium, like this one here. And sometimes I can have 
transmural. And when I see transmural like this one, this indicates non-viability. If it involves more than 50% of the wall thickness, Manata, the majority of the wall is, is necrotic and fibrotic. So it's non-viable, okay? Now, cardiomyopathies by and large leads to mid-wall or epicardial hyperinflammation. Mid-wall or epicardial. So you look at this one here. These are myocarditis. Generally speaking, they lead to mid-wall. Look at the mid-wall. Mid-wall hyperenhancement or epicardial hyperenhancement. Now, when we come to amyloid, amyloid look like ischemia in the location of the delayed hyperenhancement, but it's different from ischemia in the diffusibility of this pattern. So the pattern is involving the entire subendocardium, while ischemia is territorial. So whenever I see a delayed hyperenhancement that is located subendocardium, and that is global involving the entire subendocardium area, this is amyloid, okay? So the pattern of delayed hyperenhancement gives indicators of diagnosis, okay? So that's why MRI is becoming so important. Pulse wave Doppler of the hepatic vein. This is pulse wave Doppler of hepatic vein. Which of the following best describes the tricuspid regurgitation here? It's moderate, need more information, moderate, severe, severe, mild to moderate. That is severe. Severe, severe, because there is a systolic reversal. Exactly. So severe, confidently, without needing any further information, anything. Mm -hmm. No, right? Yes, without any further information. Yeah, I, I agree with you. As far as textbook and the communality and, uh, is concerned, yes. Whenever you have a systolic reversal in the hepatic venous Doppler, that means I have severe tricuspid regurgitation, severe enough to go all the way back into the liver. Manata, it must be severe. So it is, it has gone beyond the boundaries of the right atrium, beyond the boundaries of the uh, IVC and SVC, and it goes into the liver. That must be severe. Therefore, it is severe. High positive predictive value. Yani no high positive predictive value. Yani is al give systolic reversal in hepatic venous Doppler. That is severe for sure. Like in, if I don't find it, that will not exclude severe. La no marati kun severe, like in, no, not severe enough to go le had al hitadika. Aw severe, like in a right atrium is so big. لدرجة إنه قادر قادر to contain the jet without going back backward. لكن for my own surprise, I have two patients and I'm still negotiating with echocardiologist here. They have mild to moderate tricuspid regurgitation. One of them is mild, one of them is moderate only, and I have repeated echo twice or thrice, and they have systolic reverse. So I don't know why, and I'm still looking for an answer. Lacking as far as, يعني الظاهرة العامة إنه yes. Once I have a systolic reversal in the hepatic venous Doppler, that is severe tricuspid again. Okay. Right. Now I have this patient. Look at this patient. The images are of a patient who is dyspneic on mild exertion. His ejection fraction is normal. No other valve disease. Look at the aortic valve in the opening position. Look at the gradient across the aortic valve, which is reaching more than five. So it's probably 70 or something. So what is this? Send for AVR, reassure the patient, 
watchful waiting, repeat transthoracic or CE. So what do you think? Uh huh. Any guess? Send for AVR. Send for uh -huh. AVR. There is a gradient, but the valve itself uh, doesn't look like it's stenotic. That, stenotic that's, is that's the, the opening is good. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Therefore, AVR might be sort Very of nice. rushy because the aortic valve is so pliable, not so degenerative. The opening is so wide. So yeah. I have very high gradient, so the source of which serious. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, what are you seeing this or? Uh, so, okay, so you are suspecting a subaortic. Uh, so, if I'm suspecting subaortic, what am I going to do? Subaortic and reach to the echo. We uh, can repeat uh, the transverse. Uh, yes. Both call. I have done it and it, and it showed nothing. I'm gonna show you the T. You see, that's the T E, and you see the sub aortic membrane. Yes, now uh, it, when you do 3D, you can see it even better. You know, subortic membrane is so elusive by transparacic. You can easily miss it. Easily miss it. Okay? That's why TE is the way to go. If you have demonstrated high gradient across an aortic valve, which does not look degenerative and opening well, look for other level of obstruction, sub or supra or stuff like that. And do TE, and TE showed it here. Okay? Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip this one. Now, with all of the following are sign of severe aortic, is, aortic insufficiency, except the aesthetic pro reversal in the descending aorta, pressure half time of less than 250 ml uh, meter per second, V max through the aortic valve of more than five meter per second, Aortic insufficiency jet occupies more than 65 of the width of the LVOT. Large zone of proximal flow convergence on the aortic side of the valve. Uh, this is the right answer. Because, uh, yeah, this is the right answer. So the VMAX more than five is not a sign of severe aortic insufficiency. It's a sign of aortic stenosis, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Lakin, Lakin, all the rest are sign of, of, severe, of, aortic of severe aortic What do you think about the pressure half time? Is it a sign of severity? We can take it to the others. Uh, we, yes. يبقى يبقى البريشر هاف تايم الون انا حقيقه انا الون يس ليه؟ لانه البريشر هاف تايم از نوت ذا فانكشن اوف سيفير اي ار اتس ذا فانكشن اوف ذا اي ار كومبايند ويز ذا ال في اي دي بي سو ذا اي ار اند ذا ال في اي دي بي هاو ذي ميكس توجذر اند وات ذي جنريت ان تيرم اوف هيموداينامكس يعني اذا عندك بري اكزيستنج هاي ال في اي دي بي مع مودريت ام ار ممكن يعمل low pressure yeah. half time. إذا عندك severe torrential AR لكن the LV is compensated with no LV EDP that is high, you might not have a short pressure half time. So it's, it's more or more, يعني if, if you see it with AR, yes, you might be يعني, more towards the severity, لكن if you don't see it, that will not exclude severity. Or more likely to be in acute AR than chronic AR, more in decompensated AR than compensated AR. Uh, 
uh, the systolic flow reversal in descending aorta, yes, is a sign of severity. And aortic insufficiency that occupies more than 65 of the width of LVOT is, what about E now? E. Anybody can explain E to me or to us? Yani how come large zone of proximal flow convergence on the aortic side? Yani shnul kalam de yafi. Dizil biza. Exactly. Yes. Yani misal an al-ani za ana indi. Khayal innu this is the aortic part. Okay. The AR is coming this way. The aorta is here, the LV is here. This is the aorta. The AR is coming here, for this direction. If I have a convergence like this, before the jet goes this way, or if I have a convergence like this, which one you think is most severe? The more of convergence, the well, more sure. severe. Yeah? يعني الآن مثلا يتخيل إنه عندك مثلا الباث طب أو أو مثلا السينك السينك العادي بتاع الموية اللي هو البول بتاع الموية إذا نزلت موية بسيطة تلاقيها اختفت على طول إذا نزلت موية كثيرة جدا بتلاحظ إنه بقى في سيركلز أراوند ذا هول بيفور إت جوز إن والسيركل السيركمفرنس حقها إز بروبورشنال تو ذا أماونت أوف ووتر يو بوت إن ذات سينك يبقى كل ما الفلو كونفرجنس زاد كل ما معناته الاي ار دايركت عاليه اوكي ذا سيم ابلايز تو ام ار ذا سيم ابلايز تو تي ار كل الريجيكيشن لايك الان اذا انا اخذت الجيت طلعته برا شكله حيكون كالاد اي اي ريجيكيشن جيت يوجوالي ات هاز فلو كونفرجنس نيك اند جيت Like this. A neck is my vena contractor. Da is my vena contractor. Da is my flow convergence. Uda is my jet. Regurgitation. Regurgitation. Yes. So now in the quantification of regurgitation, we have measures relating to the flow convergence, which is the PISA. We have measures relating to the neck, which is the vena contractor, and we have measures which relating to the jet. which is the jet diameter ratio, jet area, jet length, jet width, وهكذا. Yes. لاحظ معي. في حاجة مهمة جدا. The more you go in this direction, the more you lose the accuracy of evaluation. يعني if إذا اعتمدت على the PISA, هتكون more accurate than the vena contractor. Well, vena contractor is more accurate than the jet. ليه? لانه كل ما انت دخلت الجوا الموضوع بقى ما موضوع الريجيجيتيشن بقى موضوع الريسيفنج تشامبر اند هاو ات بيهيفز اجينست ذيس جيت يبقى بالتالي كل ما انت حصرت الكوانتيفيكيشن حقك في الاوريجن اوف ذا جيت يو ويل بي مور اكوريت يبقى البيزا از مور اكوريت ذان ذا فينا كونتراكتر اند ذا فينا كونتراكتر از مور اكوريت ذان ذا جيت كوانتيفيكيشن لكن نحن ما بنستعمل البيزا لسبب بسيط انه الكالكوليشن حقتها ديفيكلت شويه لذلك بنعتمد على الفينا كونتراكت اوكي فريمبر ذيس ريمبر ذا جيت اناتومي ذا ثري كومبوننت اوف ذا جيت اند ذا كوانتيفيكيشن ريليتنج تو ايتش بارت اوف ذا جيت اوكي جود اي ثينك وات تايم از ات ناو وي ار بروبلي هافينج تايم تو تيك اونلي وان Okay. Now, a patient following mitral valve replacement with St. Jude prosthesis has a high peak transmitral gradient with a normal pressure half time. And no significant MR is seen by color Doppler. This may indicate which of the following. Prosthetic mitral stenosis, significant occult, MR shadowed by the prosthesis, the presence of SAM, ischemia, significant aortic insufficiency. Uh, most likely there is significant occult MR because the big gradient is high. Okay. 
Because most likely you'll have an uh, occult. No, not, yes, yeah, I agree with you. Not only the peak gradient, which is high, there is another indicator of, you know, there is probably a, an, an occult tumor. Yeah, no, otherwise it might be prosthetic stenosis. Mm. Yes. Right? So why not prosthetic stenosis? Normal pleasure have time. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yani, إذا مثلا لما يكون في لما يكون في stenosis, the stenosis tends to generate this pattern. See, كده. Okay. Generates this pattern. So you, this is the max gradient, and this is the pressure half time. Because قريبين من بعض يعني الماكس جريديان والبريشر هاف تايم بيكون برولونج لانه الام اس او البروسيس ستينوسيس از ستينوتيك اكروس ذا انتاير دايستوليك بيريود لكن لما يكون عندك ام ار الام ار اول ما يطلع من الليفت اثنين للال في بجنريت هاي جريديان لكن ذيس ويل ديسيليريت اند ديسيبيت كويكلي عشان كده الشكل بيكون كده عامل لاحظ الماكس عالي لكن البريشر هاف تايم از نوت سلو از نوت برولونج شورت لانه الام ار جاست افكت ذا انيشال فلو فقط الام اس افكت ذا انتاير دايستوليك فلو يبقى لما يكون عندي هاي بيك ونورمال مين اور بريشر هاف تايم ات از مور اوف ام ار لما يكون عندي ام اس ات افكت بوست ايكوالي اوكي يبقى any time I see a very high max gradient out of proportion to the mean or pressure half time, I think you must and you should suspect paravarbrally. Paravarbrally. Okay? And why should I suspect paravarbrally? يعني ليه ما أشوفه بالترانس راسك وخلاص يعني؟ يعني الترانس راسك والمس paravarbrally للدرجة دي؟ الشادو uh, بعدين we need to go exactly. right? يعني إذا... لاحظ إذا كان عندي دي سوري إذا عندي الميتاليك فالفز here that's the left atrium okay the ultrasound is coming this way okay When the ultrasound hits the aortic valve, it will form reverberation artifact, comet tail artifact on this path. Now on this path, you know, there is the sewing ring. There will be shadow here and shadow here. So this area will be black, this area will be black. These are acoustic shadows. Now, where is the location of the paravarbural leak? It's exactly either here or here. So they are shadowed by the acoustic shadows. Because these are black holes. The ultrasound did not penetrate there because of acoustic shadowing. The taliza in the MR here or here, you tend to miss it. Okay? Now, TE, TE. I have to say that. يعني تي حيحسنا لينا كيف؟ مقلوبه لانه ال ال اي بتكون نير اكزاكتلي يعني في تي اي يو ار جوينج تو سي ات ذيس واي الهارت يو ويل سي ات كده ستاندينج اون اتس فيت رايت سو ذا ميتاليك فالف از هير ذا الترا ساوند كم ذيس واي ذا شادوز ار فورمد هير ان ذا ال في And the left atrium is now without shadows. So I can see if I have a vibrally here or here. Yoga Vitali, whenever you are suspecting for a vibrally, you go for E. Okay? So in uh, this case... Uh, sorry? 
طيب regarding uh, يعني in the problem they mentioned that no significant MR seen by the color dobra. Is yeah. that also missed by the continuous wave? Even by the continuous wave. لأنه حتى ال continuous wave هي ال continuous wave always depends on a color. يعني إذا ما عندك حاجة هنا ما شايف أي حاجة because no ultrasound has reached in there everything will be mafi. Everything will be mafi. Okay? الحاجة الثانية إنه يعني ال ال CW كده ممكن تضل لك لأنه أنت ممكن تاخذها في حتة يكون في intrinsic MR فما بتعرف ال 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 position بتاع ال MR ده جاي من وين. لأنه ال peripheral ليك مكانهم peripheral وفي حتة ال peripheral في shadows بسبب ال بسبب ال sewing ring of the prosthesis. بالتالي you don't see anything there. لكن sometimes sometimes we do some non-conventional viewing, trying to orientate a shadows a little bit away. عايزة technical skills شوية وممكن تشوف الجت شوية. لكن حتى لما تشوفه ما بتقدر to quantify it. لأنه ما بتكون شايفه بشكل واضح زي ما حتشوفه في T. لكن at least you can diagnose it by transparent echo. إذا كان عندك skills enough إنك أنت to sway the shadow away from the periphery. Like in most of the time, it's hard to do that. Therefore, if a patient is having clinical suspicion of paravalvular leak, or he has hemolysis, or you have demonstrated high peak and normal mean, I think you better go for TA. Okay? Yeah, okay. Good. So I think we are going to stop here. Okay? Well, if you have any questions.